As Tom said to me in 2019, there was a seismic event in the first century, the reverberations of which are being felt today. There is this incredible rupture that we're still feeling the effects of. It's like the Big Bang, you know. Yeah. We know what the Big Bang is because we see an expanding universe. We see this expanding thing called Christendom and yeah. there is something, there was, there was something. And do you feel comfortable that the letters of Paul, that you're, you're hanging that something on the letters of Paul? It seems I'm not to hanging them on the letters of Paul. Yeah. Paul. But Paul's letters are, if you like, our first reader on the, uh, you know, the, 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 the seismometer. Yes. Uh, it's, right. It's the yes. first great jag that, yes. that lets us know that something. Right. But it's not in itself yes. the yes. Uh, the earthquake. Yes. I would go so far as to say I don't think that anything resembling Christianity would have happened had that first generation not believed that something spectacularly odd mm. had happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that that seems to me an irrefutable historical fact. Yes. What that odd thing was, how it's to be explained. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not, not for me to say. So that's the seismic event that happened, but the disciples' report of the resurrection is not the, the seismic event. Paul's letters are not the seismic event. The disciples' proclamation of this is the spike, res, you know, registering on the seismograph. What was the seismic event itself? It was something, but what was it? And Tom, in the podcast, goes through a number of alternative theories. And he isn't particularly enthusiastic about any of the alternatives. He says, you know, maybe the disciples stole the body. Maybe Jesus didn't actually die. Maybe he was never crucified. Maybe there were mass hallucinations or magic mushrooms or whatever it is. But for whatever reason, people started believing that Jesus rose, that something happened. I would say, for whatever reason, probably to do with what Jesus himself had taught before his death, and some strangeness, something weird that happens after it, whether the body gets stolen, whatever. I mean, we don't know. Yeah. People very, very early on think that Jesus has risen, that he is the Messiah. And pretty quickly, they're coming to the, the, the conclusion, you know, they're making very, very exalted claims for Jesus, that he's included with God as a kind of recipient of the cultic devotion of early Christians. So look at the earliest Christian text we have. Yeah, uh, which is probably the first letter that Paul writes to the Thessalonians. In that, Jesus is hailed by Paul as as Kyrios, as Lord, and that's a word that is also applied to God uh, by Greek speaking Judeans. Um, he is described as the Son of God. Paul is is saying that Jesus will come and he will he will rescue the the elect. He will rescue the saved, and this is a tradition that you also get in Mark, who is the earliest gospel, probably. Um, where you know he says that people will sit, the Son of Man will come in in clouds, you know, with power and and glory, and he will send the angels out, and he will gather up the elect, and and you know it's all going to be tremendous and hurrah. Even the briefest look at Paul shows us early and exalted views of Jesus. This is not something that slowly develops over generations. The earliest stuff we have about Jesus calls him the most exalted things, like Lord and Son of God and Judge of the world. And for Tom, that's not merely because Christ's followers believed him to have risen from the dead. Tom points to three factors in gaining an exalted view of Jesus. There's his resurrection, yes, but before that, there's his death and the way he embraces it as a willing substitute. And, and then before that, his life and his teaching. So I think it's three things. I think it, uh, undoubtedly the resurrection or people believing in the resurrection is a crucial part of it. I think the drama of his death which in some way Jesus seems to have embraced. He seems to have knowingly gone to his death. And the way in which it is possible for the disciples and the apostles and his followers to frame it yeah. and to, to see it as the expression of prophecies that are in Ju Judean scripture that had never be, been previously be, been understood in that light, that actually God will manifest himself through humiliation and death. I mean, that's the kind of the blinding insight that Paul, for instance, clearly has. It's something that is, he sees, he recognizes having always been there in Judean scripture and Jesus's death has, has kind of made it manifest. But neither of those things I, I think would happen had Jesus himself not been the most remarkable teacher, because I think it's the stickability of his sayings, of his teachings. I mean, I think that you could, and indeed I have, <laughs> ex explain, explain the 2,000 years of Western, you know, of history as attempts to answer who Jesus was. Yeah. Christians have done it and, and post-Christians have done it. it you know, it's, 
the question of who he was, and by that I mean more than, you know, was he a real person? But was he, you know, what, what, what exactly was he? I think this is not a back-projected strangeness. I think the right. strangeness was hardwired into him. And you don't have to be a Christian to accept that because Nietzsche said that, you know, Nietzsche said Jesus is the strangest person who ever lived. You mentioned Occam's razor before. I mean, if you're using Occam's razor, the simplest explanation is that Jesus was the son of God. Dominic Sandbrook comes out as more Christian than Tom in this episode, I reckon. Occam's razor, Jesus is the son of God. Boom. And, and you know, even if you don't conclude that Jesus is the son of God, I think this conversation shows you it's not silly to believe that. It's not silly to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. It's not. And it's not against the evidence to believe this. 